Hello, I'm Dr. Chris Aiken, the Editor-in-Chief of the Carlatt Psychiatry Report, and today we're going to take a first look at the new antidepressant, Jeperone. This is based on an article I wrote for the September issue of the Carlatt Report, and I have no conflicts related to the material. On September 28, 2023, the FDA approved Jeperone, Exua, for major depressive disorder in adults. This medication is unlike any other antidepressant, and its approval process was unparalleled as well. Today, I'm going to look at what Jeperone brings to the table. First, let's start with how it works. Jeperone is an aziparone. That's the class of medications that work as agonists at the serotonin 5-HT1A receptor. Buspirone was the original aziparone, and compared to buspirone, Jeprone has three times higher affinity for this 5-HT1A serotonin receptor, but otherwise, the two are close pharmacologic relatives. There's another one, Tandisperone. It's another sibling in the group. It's approved for both depression and anxiety, but only in Asia. Other 5-HT1A agonists that you might be familiar with but are not in the aziparone class are vortioxetine, the antidepressant, and the antipsychotics, lorizodone and aripiprazole. Jeperone and buspirone also produce an active metabolite called 1PP. And this is interesting, this metabolite, because it might contribute to their anti-anxiety effects. 1PP is an alpha-2 antagonist. That's a mechanism shared by mirtazapine, as well as yohimbine, which is a once popular treatment for erectile dysfunction from the pre-Viagra era. Now this alpha-2 antagonism, this extra metabolic effect, might create a drug interaction to be concerned about were you to give this medication, Jeperone, with alpha-2 agonists. So an antagonist with an agonist. And what are those? In our field, that's mainly guanfacine and clonidine. And this has no human data, but it has been suggested in animal studies that there might be some cancel out of the effects if the two are used together. Anyway, most of these aziparones have short half-lives, but Jeperone has overcome that, its five-hour half-life, by having an extended release coating that the product comes as, allowing once-a-day dosing whereas buspirone with a half-life of two to three hours tends to be dosed two to three times a day. The approval process for this Jeperone was controversial. Let's get into that. The FDA rejected Jeperone three times, kind of unprecedented, over the past 25 years before finally giving the drug a pass. So what changed? What made them change their mind? It wasn't the data. The FDA requires two positive results from well-designed, adequately sized, randomized trials to earn approval. And Jeperone has met that standard since 2008. But the problem is Jeperone also has 13 trials in depression that were not positive, and that is why the FDA rejected it in the past. During the recent approval, that negative data was simply given less weight. The manufacturer, Faber Kramer Pharmaceuticals, unfortunately did not respond to requests for scientific information. But a summary of the FDA's decision to categorize those unlucky 13 trials, many of which were not published, follows here. Seven of them were negative, including four that involved an active comparator where Jeperone performed worse than placebo and the active comparator surpassed the placebo, so we know the trial worked, on the Hamilton Depression rating scale. Another three of them were classified as failed but uninformative. Two of them were excluded by the FDA for using dosages that were outside the usual range, and one of those trials was excluded due to data manipulation. For example, there was a relapse prevention trial where 40 patients were removed after the blind was broken. That just doesn't sound right. Well, negative trials are common for antidepressants. You know, not all of them hit the mark on every trial. So what's the big deal here? Well, negative trials are not so common at this rate. 
Among 74 trials reviewed by the FDA for our approved antidepressants, 49% were negative, compared to 87% for Jepirone. So these negative trials are a big sink for the medication. Let's turn now to its positive studies on those Jepirone separated from placebo after three to four weeks, with continued improvement up to the eight-week endpoint. Its efficacy was similar to that seen in published trials of other antidepressants, albeit at the lower end of that range, with a number needed to treat of six to eight for response and seven for remission. So that means you'd have to treat about seven patients to see a major difference compared to placebo. Jeperone's antidepressant effects do find further support in six other controlled trials that were not reviewed by the FDA, as most of them had limitations that would have excluded them from the FDA's consideration, like small sample size or a focus on specific subtypes like anxious or atypical depression. But hey, good to know that it worked in those six trials. Overall, the evidence supporting Jeperone in depression is weak, but positive, and it's in the same league as that for Boosperone. Bosperone was actually explored as monotherapy for depression in the 1990s, and it was effective in four industry-sponsored placebo-controlled trials. Four! That's about what we got for Jeperone. Although most of those trials, in truth, enrolled patients with high levels of anxiety, which might explain why Bosperone worked there. Now, in contrast to these monotherapy depression trials, Boosperone actually failed in most of the antidepressant augmentation trials, and that's where it's often used in depression. That might be because augmentation trials involve a more difficult-to-treat population than monotherapy trials. Uh, Jeperone, on the other hand, has never been tested as antidepressant augmentation, to my knowledge, so we can't say anything about it there. But what we are dealing with here is a paradox where Boosperone might actually work better as monotherapy for depression than the way that we normally use Boosperone, which is as augmentation. Well, let's look at other ways that Jeperone might be helpful. It is being explored, understandably, for generalized anxiety disorder and also for sexual dysfunction. Those are two indications where Boosperone has also found some use. Only a few studies are available for Jeperone and GAD. And Jeperone appears to work there, but it might be less effective than Boosperone. In sexual dysfunction, the data are suggestive, but far from definitive. Specifically, Jeperone improved sexual function in women and in men with depression. And this was a secondary finding in some of the large trials where it failed to work as an antidepressant. So what kind of side effects can we expect with Jeperone? Well, Jeperone's main advantage over other antidepressants, you're going to hear it from me and you're probably going to hear it from drug reps, is its lack of weight gain and lack of sexual side effects. Remember, it's related to yohimbine, which was used for sexual dysfunction before Viagra came out. However, there are other medication options that are also free from those problems, like bupropion, trazodone, vilazodone, and possibly vortioxetine. Mirtazapine also spares sexual side effects, but it's not weight neutral. And all of those medications that I just mentioned have a much better track record in depression than our friend Jeperone. Like Boosperone, Jeperone is well tolerated, with common side effects of dizziness, headache, and gastrointestinal distress. It is weight neutral and non sedating. But Unlike Boosperone, Jeperone comes with a big problem. That's an FDA warning about QTC prolongation and a recommendation to, quote, perform an ECG prior to initiation, during dosage titration, and periodically during treatment. What? No other antidepressant comes with that recommendation. So that puts us in a big bind as to whether we're going to use this antidepressant which doesn't have much to recommend it and is requiring several EKGs just to get it started. Why? The risk here is a potentially fatal arrhythmia called dorsades de point, 
And that risk is greater in patients with electrolyte disturbances and the elderly. That's where you'd really need to worry about it. No other antidepressant comes close to that mandate. Jeperone, though, does prolong the QTC interval by an average of 18 milliseconds at the high dose, which is 100 milligrams of instant release, according to the PDR. A similar degree of prolongation caused the FDA to restrict citalopram's dosing to 40 milligrams, or 20 milligrams in patients more vulnerable to that arrhythmia. What is missing from the FDA's report is how much Jeperone prolongs the QTC in normal doses. Because remember, that was 100 milligrams, but the actual max is 72.6 milligrams. And Jeperone comes as extended release, which might reduce this problem by lowering the peak plasma levels where that 100 milligram figure I quoted for you is based on instant release. So we just don't know, but we gotta go with the FDA's difficult guidelines here. I imagine that the QTC prolongation is gonna be lower with extended release and lower in the normal dose range. But here's something I'm worried about. An accidental glass of grapefruit juice could send those serum levels soaring higher because grapefruit juice interacts with Jeperone. Well, we've got some problems here. We've got some serious cardiac risks. We got possible lack of efficacy. So when would you actually use Jeperone? With the cardiac risks of a tricyclic and the efficacy of buspirone, these are rough comparisons, Jeperone is not gonna be first line for depression. Most patients who move to second or third line options actually need something more effective than this like a monoamine oxidase inhibitor or a tricyclic or ketamine. So it's really hard to find a place for Jeperone at this time. Maybe there are patients who just benefit from this aziparone mechanism, but even then, it's hard to justify the cardiac risks when a safer option with comparable antidepressant data already exists, buspirone. Buspirone also has an intriguing synergy with melatonin, which we covered in our September 2024 issue of the Carlat Report. The physicians at Mass General Hospital did intriguing studies showing that low-dose buspirone with low-dose melatonin had unique antidepressant effects, something you might try for patients who haven't responded to anything else, and you can learn how to do that online in the Carlat Report. Cheperone should be dosed with a meal as food increases its levels by 20 to 30% based on area under the curve. The average dose in the trials was 70 milligrams a day. The range was 55 to 85. I know that doesn't exactly match up with what's in the FDA, which where the maximum is 72.6 milligrams, but those are the new dosages that are out and these trials were done over 25 years. A lower maximum dose is suggested for the elderly, that's 36.3 milligrams a day, because they achieve higher serum levels of the drug and they're probably more vulnerable to these arrhythmias. The bottom line, Jeperone brings new risks and questionable efficacy to the treatment of depression while sparing patients from weight gain and sexual side effects. <laughs> 